will sing of your love and justice. To you, Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse in heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbour in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. As we turn to the psalm, there's a little saying that I want us to consider briefly to begin with. Uh, it's a saying that you may have heard, you may not have, but I certainly have heard it a lot. And that is, people often say something along the lines of, Christians are just like everybody else, only forgiven. Now I want to ask what's good and what's bad about that statement. Because there's certainly a lot that's right about it. And we want to be clear that, yes, it's protecting something important, isn't it? Uh, Christians, we, we should know, I hope, that when we come before God, it's not because we're better, more deserving, there's anything innate within us that somehow makes you and I more deserving than people out there of God's love and mercy. Uh, in fact, it's God's love and mercy because it's not something we can earn. And so in that sense, it's true. Uh, we are simply those who have heard and understood and, and responded to the message of Christ. And that's a message that's open to anyone who would have it. Right? And so there's something right about wanting to protect that. Where I find it can be a bit tricky, though, is sometimes people will say that kind of thing as a way of defending living just like everybody else. You know, that we want to avoid being seen as holier than thou, another, another one of those great sayings. And so, you know, we, we, we ignore what God says, we do our own thing, and we remind ourselves that, you know, Christians are just forgiven people. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that Christian life should be characterised by holiness, shouldn't it? For instance, in 1 Peter, quoting God in the Old Testament, the Apostle says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who is holy, uh, who called you, sorry, is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And that word translated holy, is it's got an idea behind it of sort of being set apart, of, of otherness. And God is other. He is set apart morally even from this world. He is perfect uh, morally. He is holy. And in fact, that word is, is applied in the New Testament to all Christians. Right? We're not, not just thinking about the kinds of people who get memorialized in stained glass windows and those kinds of things, you know, moral giants who do great things. Uh, the Bible, the New Testament, constantly addresses all Christian people as the saints, those who are set apart in Christ Jesus for his service. So again, the last thing I want to do is suggest that any of us are more deserving. We know that that's not true. None of us are more deserving than anyone else of God's favour, God's mercy. But if we've come to know that truth of what Christ has done, and it doesn't lead to a different life, then we need to ask ourselves some serious questions, because what have we missed? Uh, we've missed something important within the gospel if we think that that's what God has saved us for. And with that in mind, I'm going to turn to Psalm 101, uh, because I think it helps us deal with this, uh, this question of, of living life for Jesus. And in particular, if we were to sum up the psalm, I would say it says something along the lines of worship God with integrity. We want to worship God with integrity. And you can see it sort of in the first two verses there. If you've got it open, notice, first we have a statement of belief. David says, I will sing of your love and your justice and I will sing your praise. So God is loving, God is just, he knows these things. He knows that because of that, he is praiseworthy. And David makes statements about what he believes to be true and right about God. But then he immediately follows it then with a whole list of things about how he will now respond to the truth he knows. So I will be careful to lead a blameless life. And he goes on, I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless 
heart. And that word blameless uh, is not perfect. It's not saying, it's not saying sinless. No, it's, it's a word that means something more like integrity. That's the word, for instance, that God uses of Job. If you're familiar with the book of Job, one that's blameless in his sight. Uh, but by both Job's and God's words, we know that Job certainly was not sinless. Uh, the thing about Job and the thing David is striving for is that what he wants is to live a life outwardly that matches what he says he believes in with right? So he wants to have integrity in that sense. He wants to outwardly live in a way that is in line with what he says he believes in his heart. And it's this desire that the Bible talks about constantly uh, as true worship of God. Maybe most famously Romans 12. Therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Right? So what Paul is saying is, is the same, more or less, as what David is saying. He's saying, if I'm devoted to God, if I've come to know the mercy of God, the love, the justice of God, once I know his character, it will mean I'll strive to be conformed to his will rather than to the world around me. I'll strive to live as a living sacrifice in Paul's language or a blameless life in David's. See, worship is really, fundamentally, it's about knowing God, but then being externally the same as we are inwardly. All the rites and the rituals in the world can make no difference if we don't get that right first. And we need to understand that. Now that's important for a million different reasons, but let me give you one big reason that this is incredibly important before we ask how we can do it. And that is, as we know, the world is watching, isn't it? Uh, you'll all be aware, for instance, that there was a, a huge Royal Commission that wrapped up a couple of years ago. And it was a Royal Commission into the institutional responses to child sex abuse. And if that title kind of surprises you, uh, it's because I, I think you could be forgiven for thinking it was purely a royal commission into what churches had done and the issues around churches and pedophiles amongst different church groups. But of course, it was a, it was a royal commission into everything from government-run boarding schools down to the local soccer club and scout team, and there were failings all across the board. So why is it then that, that churches, if you looked at the media or anything, were the ones singled out and, and focused upon in, in the way that they were? Well, I want to suggest it's not just that you know, we've got this antagonistic culture that wants to get us. It's actually because our failings showed a lack of integrity that other people didn't necessarily show. Their failings were still great. But of course, the Christian uh, church is the one who has the message of God. And with the message of God comes all kinds of very... You know, the Bible does have a very exacting and confronting ethic around sex. But we know that. If we're honest about what it says, uh, it's, it's very particular. And it's got a lot to say about God's concern for children as well, by the way. <laughs> you know, it, God calls us to a high standard. And... We rightly want to speak about that standard, don't we? We rightly want to hold each other to account and we want to tell people the goodness of what God has designed. But when we do that, when you, when you make those kinds of moral claims and then you don't live up to them, what are people going to do? They're, they're watching. They see us. And I can tell you now the result is, if, certainly if you have an experience that I have uh, because of my job and because that becomes obvious to people, People will, will look at us and when you make a moral claim about anything as a Christian, just about, there are certain people who will say, well, you know what, if there is a God, and I'm not convinced there is, but even if there is a God, this group of people, you know, the church certainly doesn't speak for him. Or if they do, if, if, if that's really what Christianity is all about, I want nothing to do with it. Why? Because we have failed to live up to the kinds of standards God has set. Now, it's not just in that, that's a big picture thing. But we all know it's true with the small stuff, isn't it? That if we uh, go about gossiping or lying or slandering, uh, if we rip people off and are dishonest in our dealings, if we obviously drink too much on social occasions and all those kinds of things and we're just nasty to people, uh, the world around us sees that. And they kind of, they know that those things are not what Christian Christianity is all about. And even if they don't, 
Uh, they know those are not the most attractive traits. And so again, they form their basis of their judgment of, of what we are on about, of who God is and, and what Christianity is based on seeing us. But of course, the flip side is true as well. Uh, people will notice if, if we're loving, even with those that we disagree or that we might not naturally gravitate towards. Uh, if we bear with one another, even if we're, you know, that's a difficult thing. If we're kind and generous, if we're honest, even at our own expense, uh, if we refuse to be part of slander and gossip and all those things, yeah, if we do all those things that God calls us to, again, people notice, don't they? And people will, they will come down, you know, they'll, they'll watch that and they'll draw their conclusions about what Christianity is about from watching us. So we need to take that seriously. You know, the, the research actually suggests that there will be people in your sphere of influence, in your family or your friendship circles, uh, in social groups, all kinds of places, where you may be the only Christian that some of these people know. That's the world that we now live in. Uh, there are you know, a lot of people who know almost no Christians. We need to take seriously, they're, they're not coming here to find out about what God's about. They're not opening the Bible and reading it. They're not interested. But they are watching. They are watching what those who claim to be God's people do. And they're drawing their conclusions. And so we need to ask ourselves, are, are we striving to live outwardly the same as we claim to be inwardly? Uh, are we showing the goodness of God's design in this world by the way that we live? Not, not that we'll get it perfectly. And of course, we need to be repentant when we mess up. But are we at least striving and showing that this matters to us and that we want to be different? Now, as we ponder this question, the psalm actually has something to say that will help us to do it. Right, so we, we have something here that will help us. And what David talks about next is filling our hearts. You'll notice that after verse 2, really verses 3 through to the end, through to verse 8, he makes a bunch of affirmations about what he will or won't do. And if I had to sort of summarise them, you can see there's a movement from a few things he won't do in verses 3 through to 5, uh, what he will do in verse 6, and then kind of what he both will and won't do, but in his role as king in terms of driving others away and protecting the nation of Israel. And so there's a movement through that, but you could sum them up in terms of these affirmations that he will draw near to what is good and push away what is bad. Right? That's what he wants to do. And in particular, verse um, 4 and 6, we can contrast them because he talks about the people in both of those that he will be surrounded with. In verse 4, he's happy to say, the perverse of heart I will push away. I'll be far from me and I'll have nothing to do with what is evil. And we contrast that with verse 6. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me, and the one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. So what is good? I, you know, I'll draw those good people. I want to be shaped by them. I want to be influenced by them. I want them to hold me to account. And, and I, want, I want to be with those people. But those who would take me away from the stuff of God, I want to push them from me because he takes holiness seriously. Now, I mean, I think we can all recognise instinctively the truth of what he's saying, can't we? I, I think of my teenage years. You know, you don't think too hard about who your friends are when you're a little kid. You just get on with everyone. You grow up and everyone sort of experiments and you discover life and all sorts of things go on. And some of them are helpful. Some of them are not very helpful. Certainly, I had friends who despite claiming and always believing myself to be a Christian, uh, you, you know, you, you go along with the crowd and, and, and I was influenced to the point where if you, even some of my closest friends would have looked at me and, and seen nothing to assume that I actually believed in, in Jesus. Uh, there was nothing in my life that would tell you that. Why? Because of the influence in large part of those around me. But I can say the opposite is true. Uh, the, the key moment for me in my walk with Christ was, uh, you know, I went along actually to marriage prep in my early 20s and we, we read the Gospels. I was confronted by this Jesus person and actually meeting again with God's people after that had a different sort of social pressure, one that was much more positive and helped break down many of the bad habits, if you like, that I'd picked up, the poor influences, the ungodly ones. So we all need to realise we're, we're not immune we're not the special ones who are immune from the influences of the world around us. Uh, so we need to look to David's example, don't we? Watch the faithful, listen to them, be ministered to them by them. The wicked, we want to not allow them to shape our lives. And again, Paul says the same thing in that Philippians reading. You know, that's one of the 
One of the passages which, if we surveyed everyone in the church, you'd probably find was one of the common favourites, uh, and it is beautiful. But he, what does he tell us? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And if you read the message of that whole letter, you can see what, he, what he's talking about is the gospel of Jesus. Right? He's talking about the Christ in chapter 2 who left the glory of heaven in order to be made man and to die even on a cross for our sake. The one who in chapter 3 uh, it, it gives us such glorious righteousness before God that the best that we can do is, is rubbish. The best that Paul could do, he says, is rubbish. The one who sustains Paul, who has his in chains. And yet he's saying, look, look to Jesus. And in fact, even he says, look at me as I follow him. Look to Paul's example. And so again, do we take his words seriously? Uh, do we seek to know God more? Do we seek to, to read his word, to, to take the time to dwell on it and understand it better? To ask how it impacts on our lives? Do we surround ourselves by people who might be able to be an example as Paul was an example to the Philippians, more mature Christians, or even other just long-time Christians who can spur us along and be an example to us. And on the flip side, do we, do we think hard before we accept, are we wary of things that might influence in, a, in an ungodly decision, you know, when the media we consume or the philosophies of life that we allow to get in between our ears and shape us? You know, I'll be careful ultimately to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Do we read about him, read about his life, meditate on his words and let them sink deep? That's the question before us, isn't it? Because that's the thing that will, will, will change us. And in particular, as we meditate on his cross. Because they were saying of the love and the justice of God. And if you want to see the love and justice of God, you look to the cross. Because it's there that we see the seriousness of sin. The reality that it was so grand that God had to punish it, it had to be held to account, and only the life of the Son of God was enough to do that. But we also see that the love of God is so great that He would, Jesus wouldn't take that, you know, He wouldn't count that as too great a cost. He would willingly pay it for you and for me. Now, if we want to live with integrity, we need to understand that, don't we? We need to so fill our heart with that that it overflows. That we, we, we so love what Christ is and what he has done. That all that other stuff really does become just meaningless, even repugnant to us. But it's only as we meditate on the reality of what he's done, the sin he saved us from and the inheritance he saved us for that we'll do that. And I don't think it's any coincidence that not only when you read the Gospels, are they, often, you know, they often look more like just a narrative of, of the death and resurrection, a passion narrative with a bit of an intro almost. But Jesus only gave us two things, two rites that we had to do as Christian people, baptism and communion. Both relate to the death of Jesus. Baptism, yes, we only do it once, but we are buried with him into his death. But every time we do communion, what are we called to do? Eat, drink, because of his broken body, his spilt blood. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to fill our hearts, to constantly focus on what he's done. And it's that that will push out the rest and overflow into a life of integrity, of the kind of worship that David, that Paul, that many others in the Bible model to us so beautifully. Mm -hmm.